Hello, you're very welcome to the St. Patrick's Wims Live Workplace Wellbeing webinar. I'm delighted you've decided to come and join us this afternoon because I think absolutely everybody is going to get something out of this because of course we're all working in this new reality where we live at home, we work at home, both spaces are kind of merging into the one thing and it's a tricky transition for all of us. So I'm really glad that you've come to join us this afternoon. A little bit of housekeeping first, if you have any questions throughout, you'll see a little Q&A box on your Zoom panel and feel free to send a question through there at any stage. If we have time, we'll certainly get to them. There is time allotted at the end, so we may not get to all of them, but we'll certainly get to some. The other thing I just wanted to mention quickly is obviously all of us have very different workplace scenarios at the moment. So it is going to be difficult for us to address every scenario, but there are a lot of common themes that are applicable across the board to all of us. So I've no doubt that irrespective of your unique set of circumstances that you will find lots of useful advice in the chat today. So on our panel, I'm delighted to welcome CEO of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, Paul Gilligan, advocacy manager here at St. Patrick's and registered occupational therapist, Louise O'Leary, and Sea Change Coordinator in the National Mental Health Stigma Reduction Partnership, Barbara Brennan. Now, first of all, I'll introduce Paul. He's going to give us a presentation on parenting and working in the new normal that we find ourselves in. Then after that, Louise is going to present on basically minding yourself and looking after yourself in this new work environment that we're all uh, trying to come to terms with. And then I will have a chat with Barbara basically about stigma, mental health stigma in the workplace, the roles and responsibilities we all have in challenging that and things that we can do if we ourselves feel like we're struggling from a mental health perspective in our workplace, whether we're physically there or not. After that, that's when we'll have the Q&A between, between everybody. So let's kick off. I'm going to pull Gilligan, or the CEO of St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, is going to get us underway with his presentation on parenting and working in the new normal. Well, thanks very much, Jan. Um, over the last eight months, all of our lives have changed significantly in one way or another. Uh, we adapt to change differently, of course, but stability and consistency play an important part in our emotional health. Uh, change is part of life. It's part of being human. But what makes this latest change so different is its extent, its speed, and its nature. In other words, it's been brought about primarily by fear, and we'll come back to that in a minute. How we approach change is key. Uh, this is best assessed by ourselves and for ourselves. There's nothing worse than somebody else telling us how we're adapting to change or not or how we've changed or not. This is best assessed by asking ourselves a number of questions and trying, I suppose, to answer these questions as honestly as possible. So what are the questions? Well, first you ask, you've got to ask ourselves, how has my life changed in the last eight months? Secondly, what has been the positive and negative psychological impacts of these changes? Thirdly, what changes do I feel are here for the long term and what might be changing again in the short term? And that leads us on to asking, well, what can I plan and what can't I plan? And then, then I think we've got to ask ourselves, what psychological skills do I have to be able to live with these changes and with uncertainty? Of course, it's not just our own lives that have changed, but indeed the lives of our children. And I thought this slide was interesting and nice because when you look at the slide and you see what's happening, for children, an awful lot of these things are no longer happening. Even the hug, and you know, people are very familiar with these types of images. Uh, the cinema, uh, relationships, all of these things have changed for us, of course, but have made a massive impact on our children's lives. So we also need to ask the same questions about our children. One of the biggest changes for us, of course, has been the shift to working from home. This change by itself will have psychological implications, but the circumstances of this shift, the speed, the unplanned nature, not by choice, others at home as well, schools and creches closed, etc., mean that the implications have been far greater. 
The psychological impact of this is very much dependent, however, on our personality, on our social supports, on our emotional resilience, and of course, any other issues that are occurring in our lives at this time. So have we been touched by sickness? Uh, is there job insecurity, etc.? Prioritizing our own and our child's mental health, of course, is key to this. But what do we mean when we talk about child mental health? And this slide, um, I suppose, really, I'm trying here to give you an overall. It's, it's a slide that was used by the Ombudsman for Children, the European Ombudsman for Children, and was used uh, by the United Nations. So child mental health com consists of all of these things, well-being, making a contribution, learning, being able to have a unique personality, being able to participate. All of these things are really key to mental health. Feeling loved and secure is probably one of the most important, but so are all the other components. And I suppose really parenting is about being able to balance these components. And it's also key for mental health that we're able to balance and our child is able to balance these components. Mental health parenting requires often juggling contradictory needs and expectations. So love and security versus allowing a child to develop their own identity, one that most parents can relate to. Um, allowing children to be happy and to play and yet to get the balance with that and contributing and learning. And again, I talk to lots of parents who have talked about this real challenge uh, since the uh, onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. This balance has always been a challenge for us as parents, but I think uh, certainly the events of the last number of months have really exacerbated these. So how do we balance the risks of COVID-19 with our child's need to grow and develop, to socialize and to play? You know, I'm like many other people, I see groups of people passing me by and I say, oh wow, they're not really adhering to the guidelines. And, you know, there's lots of commentary about youngsters and how they're in gangs and where are their parents. But remember, parents are grappling with this all the time. How do I parent my child in a way that's best for them and yet adhere to the to restrictions of the guidelines? And it's, it's, it's very difficult. So how does being home every day, trying to work, impact on our child's ability to grow and develop and be mentally healthy? But of course, alongside that is our own mental health. So what contributes to parent mental health? And interestingly, the same factors apply. Our well-being, we want to contribute. We're learning all the time. We're, we want to explore and develop our unique personality. We want to participate. We want to be able to grow. We want to be accepted. So all of these combine to make up our mental health. But well, many of these components are impacted significantly by work. Identity, growth, potential, personality, contribution. They're all really influenced by our working lives. But of course, they're also influenced by becoming and being a parent. And developmental psychology tells us that at different stages of our lives, these different components have different influences. For example, there's no doubt that when we become parents, a professional identity changes. I'm going to come back to that in a couple of minutes. So I'm going to break there for just one minute and I want to show a bit of film that really illustrates the joys of parenting. And I'm hoping that the technology will not let me down. So Amanda, can you maybe run that little piece of film? Thank you, dear. It is a pleasure, an honor, to break bread with you on this delightful afternoon. Oh, thank you, Mr. Oh, don't mess me. Well, little man, you know who I am? Dad, <laughs> Really? Albert, now you shouldn't have done that. Whatever possessed you? <laughs> oh, Mr. McGonagall, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Very well done. <coughs> Don't know whether, whether to eat from the coat or from the plate. Oh, Albert, look what 
you've done to Mr. McGonagall's watch. Oh! Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, Mr. McGonagall. Oh, it's, it's all such right. It's impulsive nature. Yeah. It's just like my own. Don't apologize. Oh, it's all right. Does. It's just a little child. Oh, he does the all. cutest things. Yes, he does. Oh, you should see him when no one's around. Mm, I'd like to catch him sometime oh, when no... Or uh, see him sometime oh. when no... So, working from home while parenting inevitably can impact on mental health. The question is, how does it do that? Uh, what this slide is trying to do is really outline, I think, some of the more practical impacts of working from home and parenting. So, let's look at these for a few minutes. We have more time with the kids, but of course, time might not be everything. The extra time we spend with our kids may not be relaxing or beneficial for anyone. The time-wasting activities that we used to do are probably reduced. So the commutes, etc., are all gone. But we then begin to feel socially isolated, perhaps. It's interesting talking to somebody recently who told me they missed the chat on the train. Um, other people say, I, you know, I listen to a book or a tape on the train at the only time I get. There's an opportunity to make more positive lifestyle choices. However, we also may develop unhealthy habits. Many of us are feeling less guilty. We're spending more time at home, more time with the kids. Many of us are feeling more guilty. Mary up the road is doing better than I am. She's able to do this, that, and the other. I'm not able to do that. John up the road is able to jog, uh, spend all the time with the kids, and he's the CEO of an IT company, and I can't manage that. We feel more productive, maybe, or maybe we feel less productive. Maybe we feel we're getting less done. And of course, we're less able to mask our anxieties. Because one of the things about work is, in a way, it's a place we can go, that we can be anxious, we can be down, we can be all those things, and our children might not see us. If we're at home all the time, that's a different conversation. But the biggest impact is on our identity. But up to now, have been somewhat separate worlds, our, our identities are suddenly merging. And Jan, Jan has talked about that. Um, some argue that, look, working from home is, you know, it's just more anxiety provoking. But, but is this really the case? I mean, if that is the case, then the solution is very practical. Either change our work pattern or change our parenting pattern. Others argue that the social isolation is the issue. But again, the solution to this is pretty obvious. Get out and meet more people or within the, the boundaries of the restrictions, build more social time. I think what is really under challenge is our self-image and our identity. And the things and the systems that we use to define this. So the office, the face-to-face -face meetings where our status is reinforced. The other people that we interact with in the job that reinforce who we are professionally. The way we dress even. In addition to this, I think we need to be careful not to automatically attribute anxiety related to work, to working from home. Because while parenting, uh, you know, might be adding some stress, it may be something different. And remember, all of our working lives have changed whether we have children or not. So if you look at some of the research, I mean, right back to 2015, 2016, World Health Organizations and other organizations were identifying that you know, stress accounted for 35% of all work-related ill health cases and 43% of all working days lost due to ill health. Uh, that pattern seems to be there and be relatively flat for the last number of years. They talked about the main work factors being work-related stress, depression, anxiety over workload pressures. So there's no doubt that during this period, where we've had to change our work practices. There are going to be additional stresses, whether we have children or not. Um, I think if we can add, put on the next slide, that would be great. So what do we do? How do we cope? How, we do, how do we manage this new normal? I think we really have three choices. The first one is we pretend it's not an issue and we muddle through. And to be fair, an awful lot of people have been doing that over the last number of months because deep down in their heart, they think, well, look, it's going to go back to normal or the old normal, and I'll be going back to the office pretty soon. 
The second one is we resist change and we try to move the office home. And it's really interesting, even if you self-reflect on the things you've done to pretend you're in the office. Close the door, dress up the room you're in, lots of things um, that, you, that you do that's really just taking the office and trying to move it home. Or of course, what we need to do, which is to work to resolve and adapt and integrate our new world. Of course, this third approach is really made harder by the fact that we, there's still so much uncertainty. We're still asking the questions, how long will I be working from home? Um, when will I be called back into the office? Practical changes will undoubtedly help, but the cycle the psychological journey is probably the most important. So if we look at the slide here, what are practical things we can do? Well, communication is really key. Um, I, I, I say this and everybody says, well, we know all this already, but it's amazing how people at the moment don't feel comfortable about communicating, particularly when they have a problem, because they feel we're all in this together, uh, everybody's experiencing this, and maybe I don't want to be the one who's letting the side down by saying, actually, I find this difficult. But communication is really key, finding people to communicate with. Establishing a routine, managing work and manage par man managing parenting are really vital. And I'm going to talk about managing work for a minute because we cannot work the same, and our employers cannot ex expect us to work the same. I'm speaking as a psychologist today, but I am the CEO of an organization and I appreciate that, you know, a lot of people go home and you want them to do the same job, but there's no way that they can do it the same way if they're working in a different environment. And that's a conversation we have to have. Similarly, managing parenting. Parenting's gonna become different. You might be available at 11 o'clock in the morning to have a chat with the kids. You might be able to do other stuff. You may be changing your patterns. So you've got to manage that. And then at the psychological level, it's building supports, making sure you've got time for yourself, making sure you've got time for, for yourself and the children, and making sure you've got time for yourself and a partner if you have a partner. Um, but self-honesty, I think, is really vital. But what does that mean? It means finding meaning in the losses that we've experienced. And we've all experienced losses. There's no doubt about that. It also involves us really, I suppose, um, challenging our professional self-confidence and the trust we have in ourselves as professionals and ourselves as parents and in the organization that we work for and our colleagues it's only after we do that and we resolve all that that we can really integrate the new normal so that we are able to parent effectively and um, making sure our children are thriving while also doing our job satisfactorily perhaps and most likely in a very different way what about mental health? How do we stay mentally healthy through all of this? And um, this slide here talks about a wellness plan. And this is something that I talk about all the time, which many people do anyway. Um, they're already engaged in this process. But I think it's really important at a time like this, when all of society is challenged, to not leave mental health to chance. Planning for mental health is key. And um, this, of course, is very individual. But effectively for us all, it involves putting a wellness plan like this in place. And what are the components? Well, the first thing is identifying the emotional health toolkit we have. And we do this casually every day. I love yoga. I love to watch the TV. I love to listen to music, whatever. But identifying that they are things that add to our emotional health is really important because sometimes casually we drop them. Sometimes we're forced to drop them for a period of time because of, say, restrictions. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand what the value of them is so that we can find a way to replace them or go back to doing them when the opportunity arises. From that, we need to build a daily emotional health plan, building into our day periods of time where we're doing these things, even where we have to work, we have to parent, where it's difficult to get out the door. It's really important that 30 minutes to an hour a day we spend doing this stuff. Sleep, diet and exercise, absolutely vital. We need a plan and we've got to not be rigid about the plan, but have it there formally in place. Being able to identify triggers. This is a skill that many of us have and many of us are still trying to work on. Knowing when times are starting to get, when things are starting to get rough. Knowing and spotting anxiety before it becomes a problem. Knowing and spotting exhaustion before it becomes a problem. 
and being able to put an action plan in place to address that, so that we're not sitting going, what will I do about this? That we know what to do when these things start to arise. And then lastly, this idea of practicing positive thinking and cognitive reframing. What happens if we run into trouble? Well, and the most likely trouble we run into is either becoming depressed or becoming extremely anxious. And it's that, at that time that it's vital that we seek support. First and foremost, by speaking to somebody. Secondly, by agreeing a strategy for ourselves. Thirdly, by finding psychological support, addressing the environmental things that are causing us the problem or that are contributing to the problem, and looking to try and build our emotional and psychological resilience. All the time it's key, and this is a theme I think that we really need to emphasize over the next couple of months. We need to stay hopeful and we need to maintain stamina. I think we've got a lot of conversations at all levels of society about addressing COVID-19 and about mental health. But I think a lot of the, the news, a lot of the focus is on the negative side. Of course, it's a negative uh, current, of course, it's a challenging time. But we need to really stay hopeful and try and maintain our stamina at a psychological level. Recovery from a mental health difficulty is not only possible, but it should be expected. Well, what do I mean by recovery? Well, what are the components of recovery? Well, self-direction is key. An individual and person-centered approach to recovery from difficulties is always vital. And empowerment is essential, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Recovery is always holistic. It involves our physical selves, our emotional selves, our social lives, um, our home lives. We cannot be mentally healthy without all of those components. It's not going to be linear. You can't wake up one day and say, well, oh, that's great, I'm not depressed anymore. You will always have periods of depression and anxiety, as we all have, where you need to remember key principles and start back on the recovery path. It isn't about what we're not doing, it's about the strengths we have. And it's also about having hope, taking responsibility, and respecting ourselves, respecting ourselves for what we're doing and the, the challenges that we're, that, we're, that, we're, that we're dealing with and how we're focusing and working to be mentally healthy. Again, I'm going to stop there for just one more moment and I'm going to um, really ask Amanda to show up another piece of video. And this, this one really is to introduce uh, us to the idea of what do we do about the mental health of our children. Um, and Children, where are you? I know you're here somewhere. I've lots of lovely goodies for you. Do me one. Does it pop? And all free today. Cherry pie, cream puff, ice cream, treacle tart. Treacle tart and ice cream and all free. Come along, kitty winky. Come on, but Jeremy, Trudy said we mustn't be disturbed. Get Trudy some as well, come on. So I, I, I always love showing this video because this is from um, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang and the storyline around Chitty Chitty Bang Bang is um, really about a society that doesn't have children and where children are taken away so that society can get on with uh, living its uh, functioning uh, in, in, uh, for adults. And it's interesting when you see some of the commentary um, over the last couple of months around this whole um, the restrictions. Uh, parents and children um, are often, you know, viewed in a very negative light. You know, children are vectors. Uh, it's only young people who are ignoring the restrictions. Uh, parents need to control and manage their kids. Um, and, you know, I think we need to be really careful because um, our mental health as parents will be greatly affected by our children's mental health and their mental health will be greatly affected by ours. So how do we raise emotionally healthy children? Um, 
I think the first and most important thing is going back to the core concept of our inner parent. So loving our children unconditionally, valuing their uniqueness, and believing in our own natural parenting ability. Secondly, knowing and understanding ourselves as parents, why we became parents, and of course this thing about identity, how we see ourselves as parents. Accepting uh, that growth is so important and, and, and being able to grow. And lastly, exploring and resolving our belief systems about our child. How do we view our children? Um, and, and, and how does that impact on a relationship with them? Um, what, is, what are the components of emotional health? Um, I like to present them in the form of, a, of a, an emotional health bucket. So um, if you take the, the key ones, self-belief, uh, an environmentally healthy, he healthy place to, to live, um, believing and remembering that we're loved and are lovable, and contentment. And so as a parent, to build our child's emotional health and indeed our own emotional health, we're going to be working on all of those things. Um, our role as parents is really to build, teach our child how to uh, feel good about themselves, teach our child how to be happy, uh, connecting with our inner parent, and ensuring our child's environment is emotionally healthy and safe. And again, the next slide really uh, illustrates that in a concise manner. Uh, alongside all of that, empowering our children and ourselves is key. Um, what do I mean by empowerment? So if we move to the next slide, um, we've got ego. So building our own ego and building our child's ego is vital. Meaning, being able to help our child find meaning in life and, our, and ourselves to find meaning. And that is often challenged by lots of things, but it's definitely been challenged over the last number of months uh, with, a, with, a, with a, a worldwide pandemic that brings right into focus the whole idea, idea of uh, life, death, sickness, and working together to combat something. Uh, personal autonomy is the third one. So developing our, our own personal autonomy and allowing our child to develop their personal autonomy. Taking ownership, um, really important. Responsibility and ownership, very important. Um, help, looking after our welfare and helping a child look after their own welfare. Energy and enthusiasm for life, really important. And at times has been challenging for us all over the last eight months. And lastly, building with skills and ability to be able to recover for ourselves and for our child. And I think this, there we go, excellent. I hope people appreciate the technological uh, sophistication of that slide. So lastly, I'd like to finish with some pointers on how to deal with the psychological impact of COVID. Um, informing ourselves is key, honestly, and informing our child, not as easy as it seems, uh, counterbalancing contradictory information flowing everywhere. Really important we work at that. Making sure that our child understands what's happening, that we're talking with our child, we're talking with others, we're learning and we're listening and we're getting the facts right. Reassuring ourselves and reassuring our child. Again, really important and difficult in, in these times. Sometimes statistics create fear when we really, really need to be giving a balanced view to our children and to our loved ones. Building and keeping routines, but allowing ourselves to unwind and relax, taking care of ourselves. Uh, and I mean, the many parents are getting anxious about and we're anxious about making sure that work was being done, folk, people are staying focused, but also being free to be able to just relax and do nothing. Very important. Giving ourselves a break and our child a break, particularly from the conversations around COVID-19. Um, we can't let COVID dominate our emotional and psychological lives. We can't ignore it, but we need to try to resolve the problem that has caused us, but focus on the positive things that have come out of this for us and for our children. There's a lot of talk about the tsunami of mental health difficulties that will be created by the COVID-19 pandemic. But in truth, the impact on each of us will be determined by our personality, our social supports, our emotional resilience, and our experiences through this time. Like all adversity, we as human beings are hardwired to try our best to survive and to psychologically benefit from this experience. We really have to remain hopeful that we will achieve this. Thanks very much for your time.
Thanks, Paul. That was great. And uh, it's so, I think it's so reassuring to be reminded of the things that we can control in a situation that feels like so much is out of control. So that was, that was really useful. And if any of you that are watching have questions for Paul for later, feel free to send them through in the Q&A function. We're going to move on now to advocacy manager and registered occupational therapist, Louise O'Leary, who's going to talk to us about looking after yourself basically in the new workplace. She's going to give us a snapshot of how changes to our working lives have already impacted our well-being, both positively and negatively. And then she's going to explore how who we are, what we do and where we do it all play a role in how we engage with our new reality. Thanks, Jan. And hi, everybody. I hope uh, wherever you're, you're joining today um, from your day is going well. Um, so I'll crack on because I know we're, we're tight for time. Just to echo what Jan said at the outset of uh, this webinar, um, I'm conscious there are a variety of changes and challenges people have been experiencing and this webinar is really pitched at a, at a broader level. So I'm mindful that some of this content won't be relevant if you're, for example, a frontline worker or a healthcare worker working in very challenging situations at the moment. So. Um, uh, it's, it's much more pitched, I guess, at those of us who are maybe working from home and, think, and have encountered changes like that. So just to start off, I thought it would be helpful to, um, to, to flag a few points uh, uh, th that we know about how work and mental health um, are inter interlinked. Firstly, work is a key social determinant of health. So what that means simply is that uh, work or work lives can influence our mental health in a positive or a negative way. Um, and this is something the World Health Organization, organizing, organizations like that would have uh, spoken to and published resources um, relating uh, to. So we know that work can be good for our mental health, where working conditions are good, where there's a good fit between us and the demands of our job, um, and it can benefit mental health and well-being. Similarly, if we're experiencing mental health difficulties, returning to work or getting work um, is good for, for mental health recovery. And then conversely, long-term unemployment, we know can have negative implications for mental health um, and working in negative working conditions, for example, with very inflexible inflex um, uh, workloads or work hours uh, or high occupational risk, it may hinder our mental health and well-being. And we'll see in some of the data that's coming through related to the impacts of working from home in particular, how these things are following through and remaining true uh, for recent months. So thankfully, workplaces have been attending to um, efforts to, to promote good mental health and well-being and to support people with mental health difficulties in the workplace um, to a greater degree in recent years. And I know Barbara is going to speak to that and the work that remains to be done. Um, I just wanted to, to flag a really important point as well that we can't forget, which is that we all have the right to be protected from mental health discrimination in the workplace. Um, and that includes the right to reasonable rec reasonable accommodations, excuse me, where we're uh, experiencing ongoing mental health difficulties. And when we think about mental health difficulties and what those accommodations might be, they can be very simple things like modifications to our schedules. But I think it's really important that we remember that that right remains. So in terms of what we know about some of the impacts uh, on our lives, on our, our well-being um, from working from home in particular, there's been um, a fair amount of, of surveys done um, because I suppose it's happening on such a mass scale. It's been described as sort of the biggest work-life uh, behavioural experiment um, that no one asked for. Um, so some research that has come out um, in Ireland includes this study by Morick Research, which was of 4,300 workers in Ireland who, who have moved to remote working. And there's lots of good news um, in relation to well-being and mental health. So firstly, the response overall has been, has been very positive from workers um, largely. So seven out of 10 have found that working at home during the pandemic has been a positive or a very positive experience and people are highly motivated for it. And when we think back to some of the, the facts on the previous slide, that makes sense when we think about occupational risk and um, good health and safety practices supporting our mental well-being at work because the number one reason uh, understandably that people cited as being positive 
positively associated with working from home is the, the reduction in exposure to COVID risk. So 81% of the people surveyed identified that. And the, the shift to working from home um, has also uh, resulted in an indication that actually a lot of people want to continue this even after the pandemic is over, but, but in a more blended way. Um, some of the other factors that are positively emerging um, in relation to our, our mental health and well-being is increased flexibility. So not just in relation to work hours, but in terms of the additional life choices it might afford some people. So, for example, if you're going to be working from home in the long term, you might uh, have a broader geographical area you can uh, look for accommodation in. Or you can adopt uh, a dog. Um, so I've included a picture of Benny O'Leary, my recent uh, new member to my family, because who doesn't like to see a picture of a dog? Um, but that's an example of one of the, I suppose, impacts on working from home, maybe one of the unexpected impacts working from home, from home that can improve hopefully your own mental health and well-being and hopefully uh, dogs like Benny's as well. Paul mentioned the, the commute as well, and that that can be a positive outcome. And certainly in studies like this, it's been identified as, as a positive. Um, and we know that length of commute is correlated with quality of life ratings in studies. So it can have a serious impact or a real impact, I should say, on our mental health and well-being in daily life. And work-life balance um, as well. Around 70% of those surveyed in this study would have reported improved work-life balance as a result of moving to working from home. Um, but there are um, caveats within, within that and there are areas that we need to be particularly pertinent, to, uh, pay particular attention to and be wary of when it comes to our mental health and well-being also. So uh, one example is in relation to the impact on our physical well-being. We know our physical well-being and, and uh, emotional well-being are, are interlinked. Um, and a prominent finding that's come about from surveys, not just in Ireland, but in other countries, is that um, a very high level of new musculoskeletal complaints are being identified by workers who are now working from home. And that's not just attributable to the change in the physical work space, but also in, it's attributable to the nature of change in how we're doing things. We're moving around less. We're um, most likely to be more physically uh, attached to our laptops um, and uh, as you can see from this CSO statistic from June one in five of us who are working from home report that we don't have yet a suitable workspace with adequate, adequate equipment so these are kind of practical things to consider also while um, the impacts of working from home have been reported thankfully to be largely positive uh, gender and age are two differentials that appear to, to uh, inf can influence things the other way. So for example, um, I know Paul has touched on this in relation to, to parenting, uh, some of the additional uh, demands or challenges that um, the impact of restrictions can have on parents in particular. But we also know that um, many of the uh, increased childcare and um, other caring responsibilities that are emerging or have emerged over recent months are being more absorbed by women than men and that this is having an impact on their ability to juggle work um, and that's something that was evidenced in CSO data from May and the CSO also flagged that this was associated with um, a greater impact on emotional well-being of, of women compared to men. We also know that for younger employees there is less, less high levels of satisfaction with working from home. And that's understandable when you think about um, the types of living arrangements we might live in um, at, at earlier stages in our lives, house shares, flat shares. But it's also been suggested that something that might be having an impact is the loss of the kind of opportunities for incidental learning and support that we encounter normally in, in sort of normal or on-site work environments that understandably would be more valuable to younger um, employees than, and workers than perhaps more experienced workers. And we also know then that there's a cohort uh, emerging from the data who are saying they're actually working more hours than they would have before um, and that work life is bleeding into home life a little bit more than they'd like it to be. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is to consider your own situation in relation to your work life and your situation. 
Um, and this is a model that occupational therapists use, which looks at the interplay between the person, the environment and the occupation. Um, and when there's a good fit, when these things coalesce well, it can support not just our function and performance, but also our well-being. So a few questions to, to pose to yourself is to think about, is there potential for a better fit? And I'm saying that very much bearing in mind that in relation to work, there's lots of things that are out of our control. Um, so while saying that, I'm also going to encourage you to think about potential for any positive change that there might uh, be. So in thinking about yourself um, and, and your needs, your abilities, your skills, your preferences, something that can be helpful to think about is how you regulate yourself over the day. For example, um, what helps you to feel energized, to concentrate? Um, and conversely then, what helps you to de-stress and relax when you need to? Um, something occupational therapists would, would recommend or suggest to people is to think about how you can use your senses to do that. Um, so for example, what kind of noise level works for you if, if you're living in a house share do you need to have earplugs in or do you need music or um ambient sounds around you um and i think these things are particularly important to think about now with the, this kind of phenomenon phenomenon of zoom fatigue which people are describing especially if you have a high level of technology mediated activity with other people virtual meetings teaching therapy sessions those kinds of things it's also helpful to think about your ebb and flow um, when your peak time is, so when you're at your best and trying to schedule um, your work day to favor, to favor you in that regard. And similarly thinking about when you need to take breaks, if you have a lot of Zoom meetings, can you make sure that there's 10 minutes in between each, can you spread them out over the week? Um, and also thinking about what's worked well for you in the past, in particular, if you've had a period of time in your work life where you've been very stressed or where things have been going really well, what, what's made the difference there to look after yourself? In terms of the environment then, I've touched on the physical workspace and I'm not gonna go into that because I know time is um, against us, but the, I have some links in the last slide around tips to make your work environment more ergonomic, which means uh, fitting the task to the person as opposed to, to the other way around. Thinking about where else you can go during the workday is really important. Where can you have your lunch break? Where can you step away to, to get some quiet time or fresh air? Thinking about how responsive your workplace is to feedback or suggestions. Um, and again, this will vary from person to person, but I think it's important we recognize that this is new to our employers, to our line managers too, and they might not be aware of uh, what challenges and problems are arising. And really importantly, in relation to mental health and well-being, thinking about what support, both informal and formal, is available to you. So when I say informal support, I'm thinking about the coffee breaks with colleagues, the, the colleague you might go to to debrief um, or to help you energize um, during the day. Um, and obviously those things have really been interrupted, which I know Paul has, has referred to as well. Formal supports then might be employee assistance programs um, that are available to you within your uh, work um, place. And then thinking about the task itself. So thinking about dimensions of the occupation of the task includes the demands and nature of the tasks and what tools and resources you need to do the job that's asked of you. Um, so for many of us, the demands and natures of, of, of our work has changed as regards increased use of technology, software, virtual um, means of communicating with people. So practical things like, um, you know, do you have earphones? Do you have another monitor? But also low, more lo-fi sort of things that we may have not uh, considered um, until we're not working from where's, you know, notice boards and visual cues in our environment. Do you have a work diary? Um, and are you using it effectively to schedule things? I think that last question about what you can control and what is beyond your control is really important as well to recognize um, uh, given there's so many changes that we're all experiencing day to day as well. And then just in terms of speaking to other best practices, some of which um, Paul has alluded to, these are things that we know help and are really important uh, to, to support our well-being at work in general, but maybe more important now if, you're, if you've experienced significant change in your workplace. Moving regularly, which I've already alluded to. Getting a little bit contrived about some of these things might be necessary as well to support your well-being. So even you know, setting an, an alarm every hour to remind yourself to get up and stretch or to, to go do 10 minutes of, of yoga at your lunch break. Punctuating the end of the day 
marking the end of the day where that natural closure would have happened before, perhaps more naturally when you're working on site is really important if you are struggling to keep work boundaries. Um, so that might mean that you change clothes, you change into evening clothes, you uh, choose that time to go for your walk. Or if you're using a communal workspace that you might, uh, sorry, pardon me, a communal space in the home that's been repurposed as a workspace, that you clear it in the evening, that you have a box that you sort of move everything into and it becomes the kitchen table again. Accessing green and natural spaces, um, we know it, it is proven by research to help our well-being, to help our stress levels. You might have access to a garden, but you might have a green space uh, nearby, a park that you can get to. You might be able to bring plants into your work environment. Even having uh, greenery around you in, in, in the house has been proven to be helpful. Staying connected, I know Paul has spoken to, and that's really important to try and fit in those virtual um, coffee breaks, calls to friends and colleagues um, where you can. Being compassionate with yourselves and others is really important. Um, and I know Paul has alluded to that too, that we may not be at our most productive, that we may be finding things difficult and that's completely natural and normal. And I know Paul spoke to the basics there as well. Um, and I think in addition to things like sleep, I'd add in things like personal hygiene there as well. Um, you know, when we're not going to, to interact with people in an office, things like getting up and having a shower and putting on our more formal work clothes, you know, may have changed and likely will have changed. But um, maintaining those things are important for various reasons, um, including the kind of sensory input it gives us when we're washing our face, having a shower. It actually alerts our, our nervous system and gets us going, as well as psychologically getting us ready for the work part of our lives. And finally, I'd say accessing support if you need it, when you need it, not delaying is really important, whether that's talking to a trusted colleague, your line manager, accessing employee assistance program, or calling, uh, contacting your GP. Um, uh, not to hesitate if, if you feel you, you need help to, to support your mental health and well-being at the moment. I have some slides there with various uh, resources. I know Barbara's going to speak to Sea Change, but there's some other resources and links there that might be of, of use to people. And I'm sure we can um, send them on to you if you uh, would like them after this. You can just get in, in touch with us at communications at stpatsmail.com. So I'll pass back to, to Jan now, and if there's any questions or anything, hopefully there'll be a minute or two at the end to... to uh... Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Louise. That was really, really interesting and really useful. And I think just so much relevant to so many people in terms of how we're trying to adapt our living situations. And I think because this all happened so quickly, people just kind of dived into coping and it's now kind of good to look at, well, how can I sort of make this more sustainable for myself? So thanks for that. We're going to move on now to talk to Sea Change Coordinator, Barbara Brennan. And really this is about if you do feel like you need to engage with your employer in some of the ways that Louise mentioned, if you're finding, you know, you have issues with how things are going, you need to feel like there's a stigma-free work culture there that you can, you know, approach your, your employer. So we're going to have a chat with Barbara about reducing stigma in the workplace. Good afternoon and thank you so much for joining me. And as ever, it's such a pleasure to get to listen to Paul and Louise and such uh, such simple things really, but isn't it funny that it's those simple things that really get away from us. And particularly yeah. when we're thinking about work, we stop thinking about all of that stuff because that seems like it's too simple or it's kind of on the end of the, the list, isn't it? It's, it's less important mm -hmm. than the tasks that we're trying to complete and we're trying to get done. So um, I think that's really interesting. So thank you for, for reminding us and sharing all of those pieces. Um, I think it was really interesting some of the points that have been made, you know, the idea of a child-free society. You know, this idea that, that we can leave a part of us outside or separate. And certainly I see that, that our conversations around mental health are the same. This idea of when we want to do something that we're thinking, oh, well, my mental health should be separate than this. I should go to work and leave it like I can detach my arm and leave it outside. So, you know, I think if we start thinking about some of the things, you know, like the, the really practical points that the Paul made about all that, the, the normal everyday things that we do and start considering those as our mental health and well-being, that will change how we interact with our workplaces. Um, really the piece around communication. I think as Irish people, we are wonderful for communicating, but maybe the how could be improved. You know, we talk a lot, but it's about how, how we do that. Um, and certainly from a workplace culture point of view, 
a lot of people don't really aren't really aware of their workplace culture so now to be very separate from it and to have such a new environment can be quite challenging so i think really checking in with you know what what is the culture in your workplace and how can you be part of it because here's the thing about culture it either happens to you or because of you so if it's a thing that you're not aware of what your culture is it's really about checking in and seeing who's on your team that could have a conversation with you or if there's something that's missing how can you have that conversation with them um, I think it was really uh, important about um, some of the points that Louise made around the loss of job satisfaction and the musculoskeletal mm -hmm. problems um, you know, also we see, we always see musculoskeletal down if somebody's having uh, mental health challenges and they don't want to say, actually, I'm really stressed. Um, now, I'm saying that quite often when people experience stress, they do, they do also experience um, back pain and other issues there. I know for me, I have arthritis um, and I have a number of issues in my spine. And when I get stressed, I go through severe pain. So there's a lot of connections there. Um, but really looking about how do we have mental health conversations in our workplace now that we are so separate or now that we're only seeing our colleagues every now and again or now that we're only seeing them on videos you know or through emails or those things how do we start having those conversations and then further to that how do i change the the, the context of the conversation i'm having and how do i break stigma in that environment because that's even even more difficult than if we were in person and I think that's one of the challenges that we have is to how, how do we make it a more normal conversation, an easier way? Um, you know, we, we have all seen uh, through the webinar and through the videos and, and all of these pieces, um, the children are part of our society and um, that they appear in videos. I know um, my sister was on a work call and didn't realise that her son had come in and activated a whole pile of things um, and were showing all sorts of things on the screen and and they were kind of going, um, are, you, are you okay there? And she suddenly realized he was broadcasting a whole pile of stuff. Um, and then ever since then, they've now included him in conversations when they know that he's in the room. So sometimes it's about um, really connecting with what's happening and being real about it, but also not, not judging ourselves too harshly. And I think that's one of the very big things that I was hearing from the conversations earlier through both what Paul was saying and Louise about having compassion and kindness for ourselves. So how can we, how can we, I suppose, assume the, the role and responsibility of what we're doing, but also be kind to ourselves in it? And I think that's really important. Um, when we're looking at how can we change things about stigma, how can we have conversations, and how can our workplaces do it? There's two different things that we can do. So from our own perspective, it's a matter of, well, do I know all of the things that my workplace is putting in place to have mental health conversations? Do I know the support? So Louise mentioned about the EAP service. You know, if I don't know about employee assistance, if I've never rung them or I don't know where the phone number is, or I don't even know what that is, can I find out? Um, you know, are there, are there training programs or, you know, what other services are there or who would I go to? So there's, there's information to look for if you're not aware of it. But then also in your own perspective to say, well, what can I do to contribute to the conversation? So sometimes we get stuck in this idea of waiting for, you know, well, the HR have to sign off on that or somebody else has to sign off. So I can't do anything until then. But there's nothing wrong with us checking in with each other and being a little bit human. And I think that's how we can sometimes show the way to say, well, actually, I've been doing this with my team for a while. You know, so, for example, um, I went back to my HR quite, quite soon after the lockdown started. And I said, well, actually, we have a check in now on Friday morning. We have a cup of tea. We are not allowed to talk about work and we are not allowed to talk about COVID-19. So we talk about cats. We talk about Disney. We talk about being, we talk about all sorts of stuff. And it was, we, we started putting these things in place. And then what happened was that the entire company went, actually, that's a really good idea. Let's start doing that. And we started table quizzes, all these things. But because we activated something, it, in, it changed the culture of the organization. So we all mm -hmm. can empower change in others, but it means that we have to be brave in the conversations that we have. Um, some of the things we've mentioned already that today is about the anxiety and stress and all of that stuff that we're feeling with this changed environment. Um, and certainly it's something I started looking at uh, quite soon after we went into lockdown, because I realized that it, you know, this thing isn't going anywhere for a while and we're gonna have to learn how to live slightly differently. Um, I really liked what Paul was talking about in the idea of um, the routines and, and putting those things in place and really focusing on what we can do. Um, so in the same way, I started thinking about when the government 
put out this booklet about what COVID was. You know, these are the symptoms, you know, wash your hands, all those things. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if somebody did that for mental health? And they put, they put out a booklet with that. And then I was talking to loads of people and nobody was doing it. And then I went, well, you're somebody, why don't you influence change? Come on. So, um, so I'm delighted to let you know that we now have a booklet. Um, it's called A New Reality. And it's, it's really looking at anxiety and stress and what does that mean and what does it look like and you know what we've done is we've put things in so some of them are workplace challenges some of them are home so you can see it's broken down it's nice and colorful it's in different sections and it covers things like i'm getting really angry because the guy in the shop standing too close to me is that normal you know or um, as paul said really importantly how do i have a conversation with a child you know, this, these things of they're anxious, I'm anxious, I don't know what to do. So really what we're trying to encourage people to do is to have conversations because we're all experiencing different things. We're all experiencing anxiety. We're all experiencing stress in a different way than we ever did before. And now is our opportunity to start saying, actually, I'm not doing great today. And I think that's one of the biggest gifts that we can give ourselves is to lift that weight to say, I don't have to be superhuman. I don't have to be all things to everybody all the time and if I could allow myself that little bit of of ease maybe it's to say actually I need a little bit of support and I think that's a, a, something that we can do so and I think when we show that that I'm okay to ask for help or I'm okay to say I'm not doing great today it opens another door for people who are around me whether it's my colleagues my family my friends that they're hearing I'm okay to have that conversation. So if they ever need to have that conversation, they feel more open to come to you. And I think that's one of the really, really powerful things that if we model that behavior, it can really help us. Um, I, I'm delighted that um, Louise put up those links as well. I was gonna mention about um, some of the links like the um, Human Rights Commission um, and some of the places that we can go to get help and support. Um, I'd also recommend the citizens information is brilliant when you need support and you need to find where to go to get information. There is lots of different places to go. Um, and obviously then um, I will always recommend the, the HSE, um, yourmentalhealth.ie if, you if you need a little bit of support for something. Um, again, mentioning the EAP program, if you've never lifted the phone, find out what the number is and ring them. And the reason I always say that is because people say, oh, it's a confidential line, and then they ring and they get asked their name and their phone number, where they live, where they work, and if it's work-related. And then it doesn't feel confidential anymore. And the reason we get asked those questions is because they want your name to speak to you, your number in case you get cut off, the name of your company so they can build them. They want to know if it's work related or not, because there's no point in putting you in touch with a financial advisor if you're going through a bereavement, you know, or if it's mental health related or whatever the thing is, they want to connect you with the right person. So understanding those things changes the way you access the help. So if you think that you might need one of those services, Today's the day to go and find out. But equally, by you looking at it today, it means you can have an open conversation with somebody else. So now you can go and say, God, I didn't know we had that service here. Did you realize? Or even, you know, I, I've accessed this EIP service and actually our family can use it as well. Did you know that? So the way we have conversations around mental health doesn't have to be the, how's your mental health? Because that would just be weird. You know, it is about how do we have a conversation? And, and lastly, I think the thing I'd say is, we don't have to have all the answers because I think we're so afraid at the moment of saying the wrong thing. We're so afraid of not having the answers. We're so afraid of giving somebody the wrong advice. And that's why we have two of those and one of those mm. because we should listen twice as much as we talk. So know that you don't need all the answers, but if you can make a cup of tea, you're halfway there to supporting somebody to have a conversation. And I think that's one of the biggest things that we can do really. Mm. So um, in relation to sea change, we are delighted to um, have launched our H Green Ribbon campaign to get people talking. Um, and it's really about looking at how do we reduce stigma? How do we understand stigma and what it feels like? So if anybody wants to find more about that, because I'm very conscious of your time, um, you can come to seachange.ie uh, and you can find us on Twitter, on Facebook and on uh, Instagram. I have to think about that for a second. So you can follow us and find out more there. Um, and in relation to the workplace, we do have a workplace programme if you want to find out more. And equally, our uh, booklet is downloadable and it's free. And if anybody wants a printed copy, you can um, get in touch. Um, and our email is info at seachange.ie. So if that's, if that's of help, I really hope so. Um, but really, I think the biggest message from today is mind yourselves to do the nice things for yourself because you can't help somebody else if you're not looking after yourself first. Thank you so much for having me on.
Thank you, Barbara. That was really brilliant. And my God, you crammed a lot into that time. I'm so impressed. I was like, I have wow. notes. <laughs> Watch her go. That was wonderful. <laughs> I'm just going to bring um, Louise and Paul back in briefly if they wouldn't mind turning on their, their videos and we might have time for just a couple of questions. But while they're doing that, I wanted to ask you about, like, obviously one of the most negative things about stigma around mental health is our ability to internalize it and how that internalized stigma can then hold us back from being able to raise these issues that we may have with other people or start a conversation. What advice would you give to people who are really struggling with that piece, who feel that it's my fault, I'm failing at everything and are having the negative sort of self-talk all of the time? I think that's an excellent question and it's one of the things that when we're educating people about stigma we explain about public stigma and self-stigma. So public stigma is the uh, I'm going to do it to somebody, I'm going to put stigma on somebody, um, or I have had somebody stigmatise me in the way they've treated me. Whereas the self-stigma is that piece you're talking about, how I am stigmatising myself. So a really good example would be, um, let's say I go to the supermarket and I feel that I'm being treated differently because somebody knows I have a mental health difficulty. So maybe now um, I don't feel comfortable going to that shop or being around those people, so I'm going to isolate myself. And then in that isolation, I'm going to tell myself, different things and so it's about how do I how do I start realizing that that's either not true or even if it's their presumption or their reality I don't have to accept it and I don't have to live it and certainly for me if I if I look at my lived experience um, I started struggling with mental ill health when I was 14 and I ended up in, on life support when I was 27 so I went through huge periods of public stigma and self-stigma um, and I now run our national stigma reduction campaign. You know, people can and do get better. And I think the biggest thing is to start doing the kind of things that Paul talked about. You know, because if we are so focused on the negative and we're so focused on the difficult thoughts and down that spiral, the more you're going to get is of that same nature. And it's one of the things that massively changed my life when I started focusing on what I did have control over, what I could do and what the positives were. And the more positive things that I was doing and the more actions I followed there, the more I felt better and the more I felt better, the more I wanted to do them. So uh, I think the biggest thing is really to, to, um, to challenge the thought. So certainly CBT and that's cognitive behavioral therapy for anybody who's listening and doesn't know what that is. It really helps to, to activate this idea of is that thought true? And if it is, what can I do about it? And if it's not how can I change my thinking? So it's really about what can I do in this moment? The other thing that's really helpful then as well is to look at the positives in my life and say, well, what other things can I focus on that will momentarily give me the break from that? Mm -hmm. So, and lastly, for me, the idea of faking it till I make it. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but honestly, on days when I was really struggling and I knew that routine and I did not want to do it, I didn't want to go for a walk. And since mm -hmm. um, the lockdown, I have walked... Um, about 800 kilometers. I am, not a walker. I am not a walker, but every single morning I get up and I go for a walk and I come home and I do yoga and I have my breakfast. That is a new routine and I am doing it to mind my mental health because I do not want to get to a place where I haven't done those things and I start feeling bad. And there are plenty of days, like this morning, I did not want to go for a walk. So I faked it and I got up and I put my shoes on. And it was only when I was on my way back that I actually started saying, actually I feel a bit better after that and I think that's the thing that we have to allow ourselves the space to feel kind of not great but be doing it anyway and if we're getting those really negative thoughts to challenge it and say where is this coming from why and what can I do what is the one thing I can do right in this minute to feel better so it's not that I have to feel all the way better but maybe listen to a song and jump around the room you know you're yeah. gonna have different yeah. benefits so what can I do right now that might help just a little bit yeah that's great advice. And the fake it till you make a thing, I know, as you say, it's not for everyone, but there's, it certainly works for me too. It's that idea of you don't want to do this, but just do it. Just push through that little hump and funnily enough, you'll trick yourself into it. It's all, it's great. That's it. I and it's a ripple effect then. Yeah, exactly. That's it. It's like dominoes. Um, Louise, I wonder if we could just bring you back in momentarily there, if you turn on your, your video. I just, there's a question has come in around shared living spaces so people who maybe don't own or live in their own individual home and they're sharing a space with multiple people 
that can be quite difficult really to sort of decide unilaterally let's designate this part of the living room as you know the boardroom or whatever it's quite tricky and I'm wondering you know have you advice for people as to how they can navigate some of those conversations because you know let's face it they, they can be prickly at the best of time in, yeah. in shared living situations. Yeah it's a real challenge like sharing houses with different personalities and everything uh, different work schedules in the best of times is, is um can be problematic and I think that's why we're seeing those higher levels of dissatisfaction with working from home amongst younger people because they maybe don't have the comfort of, of uh, private spaces. I mean I think well I think firstly you, ca you can't necessarily um, change your, your housemates and things like that but I, I mean I think the first thing you can do is try and have a, have a communi improve communication about your needs and, and their needs um, and try and find some compromises and I guess practical things you know like trying to find it if there's one very valuable shared space are there particular times even if it's 15 minutes where it's sort of bookable or those kind of things yeah. for people who need, uh, <laughs> you know like let's say someone's doing a job interview or something for example um, so thinking about practical things like that Again, if someone is using um, a communal space like a kitchen table or something like that, it'll be a benefit to them and the, the house at large if the work stuff is removed when work is over, that it's it's repurposed to general life. Um, and then there are, if, if it's still difficult, I think um, looking at ways you can mediate um, some of the environmental challenges by doing things like using... Um, earplugs changing the aspect of, of where you're looking you know so that there's a lot of if there's a lot of activity behind you you're looking at a different part of the room um using other other sound of silent if the earplugs is, aren't working um using music or things like that um or seeing if there's alternative spaces you can use i know a, a colleague of mine has looked into using accessing co-working spaces nearby to them um i know that that will vary depending on uh, what restrictions are available but you know in the future mm. libraries and things are open and things like that it might afford opportunity so I think communication compromise um trying to get a system in place and if that doesn't work looking looking at what's um achievable yourself what kind of strategies you can use yourself mm. Paul a question for you just around levels of information to give children so as this goes on I think a, a number of parents would have maybe tried to play down just give the bare essential pieces of information at the start of this pandemic but as it goes on we're approaching Christmas things are going to be potentially a bit different and not as they usually are what advice would you have for parents about what degree of information to give to their children without freaking them out? I, I think information for children has got to be presented in an age appropriate way and it's always best done where you're checking out how much they already know and how much they're able for so right. you know the, the, the parents swing one, 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 one way is to go at it with it give them the whole detail and you know write down to the R number and then there's others who will, who, who will tell them relatively little but they're picking up information everywhere so what you're really trying to do is, is, is help them understand that and broker some of the uh, inaccurate stuff and make sure they're sifting through it. So the first and foremost, the first thing you gotta do is check out what do they already know? So I always think with children, you start with the questions. You know, what do you think of the COVID situation? Or are you worried about COVID-19? And then you move from there. And that's a, that's, a, that's a skill pretty much every parent has because they're used to brokering those conversations that are sort of difficult, whether it be about a death in a family, whether it be about the, the dog that's sick, whether it be about the incidents in school, and it's, it's, it's about approach. Um, the other thing I think we really need to do, particularly with children, is change the narrative. We need to start talking about overcoming and getting through this. Now, I, I'm very clear that unfortunately, that space has been dominated by the Trumpy type of people who are saying, you know, ignore it. But I think there's, I think the problem at the moment is our narrative is very much about, oh, it's terrible, we're all in trouble, we need to do more, we need to do more. I think if we change that narrative to actually, we will get through this, we can get through it, and indeed, 
we are getting to it. And that motivates people to continue to do the right thing. But if you're continually hearing how bad things are and how awful things are, people get fed up and they start thinking, well, no matter what I do here, it's not going to matter. So I think, and I think it's particularly uh, uh, with, with kids, it's about really focusing on that positive message and the great things they are doing. And I think, yeah, the, the conversation with Christmas about Christmas has to happen. And it's going to be, it's a different type of Christmas. We might have a different type of Christmas. But I think no matter what that Christmas looks like, it can be framed in a positive way without ignoring the losses. But I think if we, if we frame it in a way that's around fear and uh, uncertainty and, you know, the world is in crisis, I think children will find that very difficult to cope with. And many of them will simply reject that as they're doing and saying, well, actually, I'm not buying into this because it's my world and I'm going to make sure it'll be fine. So I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's about it's about style and it's about positivity without being naive and without ignoring what they're hearing and checking out what they know and then clarifying what's actually factual. I think it's also, you know, handy that the WHO has come out and confirmed that Santa, by virtue of the fact that he's magic, is just immune to COVID-19. So, you know, that's that's good. It's good to know that, I think, moving towards Christmas. And, and, and the, well, that's right. Absolutely. That, that Santa and the elves are also immune. So we're, we're, we're OK on the on the on the. On yeah. the on the on the on the core thing. <laughs> yeah, <we're fine. laughs> I'm conscious of time tipping away, and I know anybody that's joined us would have just want, joined us for the hour. So if you've missed any of it, if you think if you know somebody who you think would find this interesting, you can watch all of these webinars. They'll be posted afterwards on the walkinmyshoes.ie website. Barbara Brennan, thank you so much for your time. Louise O'Leary, thank you for your time. And Paul Gilligan, thank you for your time and all of your expertise. I think I've certainly gotten lots out of it and I'm sure everybody who joined us has too. Thanks, John. Thanks Take so care, everybody. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.